Okay, okay, please keep clapping again while we bring back to the stage the director, John Strong, brilliant dad, Douglas Chirola. Thank you. Thanks for saying. Thanks for uh, being polite. <laughs> You're tanner than now. Um, okay, I'm sure everybody knows how to do this, but I always start off by saying uh, we have microphones on the floor and in the balcony, I believe. So if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and somebody will come to you. Um, it looks like there's actually already questions up there. Is that true? Um, okay, well, let's start with you guys, and then we'll come back to me. Um, my question is, I feel like nowadays everyone's just offended all the time. Uh, so I don't know if that's just my opinion, so I was wondering if, you, if you've observed that as well. So was, what I mean is that it was very refreshing during this movie to laugh at lots of offensive things. But, uh, but do, you, do you agree with that point of view? And you, Can you uh, explain why, why is everyone so offended now? What was the turning point? I mean, why is everyone, I mean, I could go on for hours about that. I, I would say I was, I was nervous about that. There's, there are these moments in the movie where you sort of want, like, like any documentary, usually if you're lucky, you get like two awkward laughs in a documentary to know the audience is alive until the end. And this, there are, there are a bunch of things and you get a feeling how it's going. I was really nervous about that Canada joke at the beginning. <laughs> and that was the hugest laugh that I ever got. So, so here, I would say it's the opposite. I, I'm not sure why everybody is so offended, but I, I would say that one of the reasons people say like, oh, why'd you make this? And we have, there are many, re I don't know if there's ever one reason why you get to a place where you make something, but certainly one of the more personal reasons for me is that is exactly what you're saying, is it just seems like there are these people who are like laying in wait, like, uh, like behind rocks or something, for somebody to just say something that goes like a little bit too far. And they don't attack what the point the person's trying to make, they attack the delivery method or the words they use. And that is really a big issue for me. It's a, I mean, I've been uninvited to so many, my wife's like, I mean, so many dinner parties just where it's just like we're never gonna get invited back there. <laughs> and, and I'm not even saying anything. I think of that controversial. Certainly making this movie, I realized like when I would take this movie home with me, it's like getting out of the Navy. Like you're just in this pla a different place. Um, but I, I don't know why, but, it, but it, it's definitely something we thought about. There, it, it, there was a moment when we were making the movie where we, we kind of were thinking, like, can we put this in here because we're going to be associated with it? And uh, even though it's like, hey, we didn't make it, we're just displaying it and showcasing it and I guess curating it. And we were even thinking, like, how would this affect, like, if we submit this film to a certain festival? If they don't like it, or, and there are our other films going to get, those are the motherfuckers with the lampoon thing, and that would be the end of us. Well, they probably wouldn't say but they, but, but that would, well, we were that worried, and I don't, people are like, oh, it's about political correctness. I don't think it's about political correctness. I think it's so much further than that. It's so much more Orwellian than that, where we just, people self-censor themselves in fear that they might say something not that it's gonna offend someone, but someone will point out that maybe they're being offensive. So I appreciate your, your question. I don't know why it's like that, but I, um, I like showing this movie and, and hearing that people feel free enough to still laugh at certain things. Um, so I appreciate that your, your question. If I knew why it was that way, I would, I would try and, and fix it, but it's not working out for me. I mean, people don't even stand near me at my daughter's soccer games. It's like, there's the weirdo <laughs> maker guy. When they see this, it's probably all over. Um, I think there's one in the balcony or right here? No, there's one right here on the floor. Everybody we 
met with, that we interviewed, it's like, have you tried to get Henry? You won't get Henry. Because what happened in the movie actually happened, where he doesn't talk to any of those guys, except the guy with like the biggest bookcase in Manhattan, the Chris Surf guy, if you're old enough, you probably remember his dad, Bennett Surf, the publisher. And, um, and that was a hard one to get, we eventually got him. We, we called the 800 number, we have a great executive producer who made movies like Searching for Sugar Man and Man on a Wire. And he, his son owns a bar, if you've ever read the thing where he went out at a bar and served drinks in Brooklyn, that's actually his son's bar. So we sent our editor there a few times, he lives in the neighborhood. But ultimately, um, I made another movie called about poker called All in the Poker Movie. And we got Matt Damon in that movie because he's in Rounders, right? Matt Damon found his way into every part of that movie because he's Matt Damon, and why it even happened to be articulate, so we, we justified it work. And I think I was a little bit nervous that if we got Bill Murray, even though his, his life with the Lampoon is about seven months long, that he would end up in this movie. I think Chevy Chase is the natural person to, because he was there in the beginning with Lemmings. You know, he's at Saturday Night Live. He's friends with Doug Kenny. So, um, yeah, we try, but I, I don't feel, I, we've, you know, I tried harder to get, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin in another movie, which I did get and I was psyched about it. Um, but um, maybe he'll come see it. That would be helpful if he came and saw it and liked it. He's in it in turn, when you see him young. So. All right, we're clapping to get, get Bill Murray here. <laughs> um, there's something in the balcony, yeah? Oh, back there, nice. Um, I first uh, discovered uh, National Lampoon in the early 70s. They were hidden in the bottom drawer of my father's dresser. What was your first exposure to the magazine? Um, I'm, I'm weeding out a really dirty joke, I'm sorry. The, um, Stop self-censoring. <laughs> you mean, what's the first time I exposed myself to the National Lampoon? Okay, I just said that. Sorry. The, um, she made me. So, um, I think like a lot of People my age, my first experience was seeing Animal House. My dad was in a fraternity. The fraternity had sent out letters, as I, I've learned a lot of other ones did, telling members and alumni members to boycott Animal House, because it was gonna make fraternities look bad. In actuality, fraternity numbers were really low after Vietnam, and, the, and Animal House single-handedly brought back the fraternity. Um, my dad is not really a movie guy. He, I don't think he likes any movies that are in like past the black and white era, but we went to this movie in this small town in Connecticut, seven o'clock show, Fine Arts One, Westport, Connecticut, and we got right back out in, online. It's the only movie I've ever seen twice with my dad, and uh, that was my first exposure to it. And then there was a book that had that came out a few years later called the Tenth Anniversary um, Compilation. The cover for it, if you if you're a fan of Lampoon, is in the movie. It's the hippie looking at the mirror, like the IBM guy. And, and I had that book, and I still have that book. Um, it's just one of those things that I've kept from first, you know, college, first apartment, you know, the, where I live now. So that was really the, the two big things for me. And, the, and, the, and I, you know, I would, there was a store in town and you could go and, and get the magazine at a certain age, I bought it. It was near that, that era where I don't think it was at its strongest, um, even though they are surprisingly still funny, even though they're not considered the golden era. But that was really an animal house in that book. Um, who's seen it so far, apart from all of us here in Canada? I mean, people from the film. Who's seen it? The, the uh, publisher, Maddie Simmons, saw it, and he liked it. His wife, I don't think, liked it as much. Um, but then they went some a, a festival that was near them. We, we sent them so he could, they could see it with an audience. I really wanted him to see it with an audience first, but we had an agreement with him where he could see it. He, he didn't see it before it premiered at Sundance, but after that he did. Um, and then they really liked it with the audience. And then when we were at Tribeca, it, we, um, Tony Hendra saw it, Rick Meyerowitz saw it. He's, he's in the movie, he's the guy who made Mona Gorilla in the Animal House poster, is what he's most famous for. Sean Kelly saw it, Brian McConaughey, he's the, the uh, guy who did Kitten Caboodle, which if you're, you know, is the um, Simpsons, what's the uh, cat and uh, James Right, that's the basis for that. So those those are the people who have uh, seen it to date. And that's it. We really want to encourage people to see it with an audience, which can go either way, but I feel they'll, they'll do that. Oh, and then Jerry Taylor, who was the uh, businessman in it. And, and I, I should say, I mean, it was, 
really difficult to get these guys in this movie. I think sometimes when you see a movie where the filmmaker's chosen to tell the story with interviews, there's this assumption that it's like, hey, they're just waiting by the phone. These guys are really protective of their story. They, they did not want to be in this movie. They did not want us to make this movie. Um, a matter of fact, I won't say which filmmakers, but one of the, uh, Jerry Taylor is from the High Society of New York, and he's friends um, with someone whose daughter is a filmmaker, and they wanted them to make the movie because he thought he could control them. Um, so it was difficult to get them, and I was nervous about what they would think, because this is their baby. As one of them pointed out in the interview, Mike, Mike Reese and Al Jean both said that you get to a point in life where you've done enough that your first jobs go off your resume. And they're like, nobody takes this off their resume, even if, it, if they've done so much more. It's just, it just has this connection with people that they love. They love being part of Oh, Sam Gross saw also the famous New Yorker cartoonist. And he, he, uh, yeah, he liked it too. So, he, we, so far it's been good. It's been good. And I do feel they would tell us if they, if they didn't, if they didn't like it. Um, uh, is there more? Over here? Yeah. Um, first, I, I, I'm over here. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, I uh, brought back a lot of great memories, and because and, 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 I started reading way back in the beginning, and got to see the National Lampoon show, um, that production. That's amazing. The, with Chevy Chase and, and, and uh, Gil Radner and stuff, at, at my father's place in New York. That, that was great. And so that was like a year before Saturday Night Live. But my favorite... Um, thing that I will always, unless I really get really bad Alzheimer's and can't remember anything. Uh, one of my favorite tasteless moments uh, was the Stevie Wonder cover with the 3D glasses. But it wasn't that, it was the following issue, where they issued an apology. Do you know? And it said, like, we know that was in bad taste, but he'll never see it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just will never forget. So well, that, well, that's one of their other biggest lawsuits is similar to that. Liza Minnelli sued them for the whole fag, hag, mag, Judy, which is a whole thing about Judy Garland. And so they negotiated that they would give her a page to say whatever she wanted to, to rebut it in a future issue. And they did. And then they went and did a parody of Liza Minnelli on the other page. So it's, it's a tough, it's a tough crap. It's a tough, uh, you know, that, it, it, there's just something to me freeing about it. I, I just, I, all those, those, you know, I just, I just love that. Just the point of view that they have. In other words, the idea that you don't know what you're gonna, who they're gonna make fun of. You, nowadays, I feel like if it's a political thing, or even when there's some little humor that's out there, you know, if you look at this magazine or watch this channel, pretty much what the point of view is gonna be. And that's what I found so amazing about this. You just didn't know. Like, I don't know what they have against the Kennedys, but they do not like the Kennedys, the people there. But they hate Nixon more. So you, you that, it's that balance of it. But I don't think they're balancing it on purpose. I think they're, they just are like anti-phony, anti-authority, anti-hypocrisy. Uh, there's somebody down here that you pointed at, right here. Yeah, when I was uh, 15 years old, I had a moment of early teacher. And I brought all that, I went to clean out my mom's house a couple years ago and I found it. But it doesn't fit me anymore. So I really like to find a woman girl. See me after the show. The, uh, the, the, that matter of fact, at one of the screenings in New York, the guy who did all their shirts showed up. You know, and just said, I did all their shirts. So maybe I can bring it up. Ah, those of you didn't hear, somebody down here is looking for a t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. yeah, go. Sorry, I, I read a, a bunch of interviews with various Lampoon alumni who were saying that they had all been introduced by a guy named Peter Ivers. Have you ever heard the name Peter Ivers mentioned at all as somebody that kind of connected it all these people? It sounds familiar, but I, but I had not heard of them. For, for, I, I, my experience of interviewing the people, they might all know him, but I don't remember a common person that brought them all together. The, for me, one of the things that's so interesting about the, the group there is I always think of like if, if life, our worst fear or one of them is that it's just eternally like high school, right? And so I always feel like these people, the men and the women that work there, would not have been at the same cafeteria tables 
in high school. There were really not a lot in common. Even the ones that went to Harvard, there's a disparity of wealth between them or their backgrounds. And um, I just don't think they would have been friends, a lot of these guys, if it wasn't for working at the at the Lampoon. That's one of the that that's one of the other personal avenues into the movie for me is because that's how I feel about filmmaking. Like the people I've made basically nine films with a core group of four or five people. One of our films was here last year, a very different film, a brilliant film called Actress. And none of us would have been friends if it was not for for making movies. And that's how I felt these guys were. Like they put aside whatever their issues were, even though they they then came back in these more um, typical ways when people were around each other too much. But they, but they somehow got it together to make like this great magazine and these great shows. But I don't, I recognize that name, but I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not, I don't remember them as a connector to the different people. Okay, we have time for one more, there's one in the balcony. Oh, hi, um, I just want to say thank you for um, introducing us to this inner sanctum of the National Lampoon, it was really enjoyable. Um, and I uh, love the interwoven artwork. But I wanted to ask you if um, you feel that there's some sort of parallel similarity to the Charlie Hebdo situation in terms of how misinterpreted the messages were, are, have been about that artwork. You mean about the, about the art messages in terms of... Correct. How it's been misinterpreted in terms of it's sort of seen as being racist, but actually he was trying to make commentary to... Well, I, 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 I mean, I really appreciate that question. When, when I was, I, one of the interesting things when I would in certain meetings talk about the, the political nature of the work, I think people just was like, yeah, that's just like director BS, whatever. And then sadly, when Charlie Hebdo happened, people seemed to start to understand what, what kind of what I was trying to say. I, I think, it, to me, it goes back to it's people, there just seems to be some people that want, that their whole job they want it to be is to try and point out like deficiencies or something bad about somebody or try and make a case. They're not even listening to the explanation or what the point is. They just are getting upset that somebody's drawing something or, or writing something. I thought the guy Sean Kelly, one of the many Canadians, I, I, did he come up? Cross, at least in some of those stories, how many of these people were from Canada originally? Oh yeah. I mean, it's a huge connection um, to here. It's, it's amazing. Um, but when he was telling the story about the Kentucky Fried Chicken, I mean, and that was one of the ones where, when I was still trying to figure out how we would put everything, put how much commentary from me as the filmmaker would be in the movie, and I really went after him on that, on that, because that just seemed so far gone to me. But his explanation was right, he, that in his mind, or what he was saying they were trying to get after, is that the colonel is sort of like selling a plantation owner. Like his character is not like Ronald McDonald a clown or a Burger King the King, it's a plantation owner. He's the colonel. And so in a sense, he's selling their, this sort of time of plantations would be their point. But now people would just look at it as like, you know, in this other way, in this other way, um, so I, I, I do think there is a direct parallel to that. And people will say, "Well, do you think this, like this could never work now?" I, I feel like this is like the time for it. I, I have the complete opposite direction. People are like, "Well, people's attention spans, and there are all these other things you can look at." For me, that's a, maybe the way to rise above all the noise is to be that more outrageous. Um, that, that's my feeling about. I mean, I wish that somebody would try and give this a go again. Well, one of the things that was interesting to me learning about this is when they talked about how they went after these really famous uh, cartoonists at the time, Arnold Roth, and people who did comics, and Sam Gross, that these were big, they, I mean, they, some of them still are, huge comics, or huge cartoonists. Um, but they said they just knew that they had this material that wasn't fitting into the place that hired them the most. In that, they, in that they would be out there. One of the, the great things Sam Gross said in his interview, I said to him, well, when the National Lampoon went down, what, what, you know, when you had those ideas, what do you, where did you send them? Or, you know, there was no place to send them. So what did you do? He goes, well, I still draw them. And then he said, and I put them in this cabinet. And he just had a cabinet full of stuff that there was no place to go. And I feel there's people out there today that could 
replicate that, or would want to if they felt they could do it without chancing that they could never make a living or that their kid's going to get not into some school or, you know, or if they make a film, they won't get into a festival. Because they don't. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate This audience was amazing. I, I am a hot docs believer big time. This is just awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget the votes. The audience votes.